Hello, everyone. This is Robert Aceves, and we're starting a new episode of MindFit Podcast, and I'm here with Neil Babbins, and I'm, my name is Robert Aceves. How are you doing, Neil? Doing great. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to start another episode, and I had a really interesting week, but other than that, it was pretty good. How about you? Oh, I had a pretty good week. It's been busy, as usual. Um, everybody's been pretty worried about the upcoming election, and um, yes. yeah. <laughs> you know, and oh my goodness, some sessions that I spend are nothing but that, you know, just talking, like ranting and venting and, and, and processing that. And, uh, it's been kind of hot in the San Fernando Valley. I don't know how it is for you. And, uh, yes. yeah, it's got a heat wave like right before Halloween, a couple of weeks. And it's just really, it's almost like it's August. So, um, but it's been good. I mean, I'm making some plans to go on some more road trips and get out of town and, hmm. you know, decompress and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, it's it's been an interesting week for me too. Yeah, it really has ups and downs. You know. Yeah, I I really cannot believe this weather. By the way, it's it, it usually by now it starts to get cooler. It's nicer, but it's been yeah. really hot. And yeah. I just saw an article that Arizona had um, uh, more than six months of tr- uh, triple digits uh, weather oh. in in this year so far, and it's right. breaking records. And I just I cannot believe how hot it's been lately. So. Hopefully yeah, it gets we, better. <laughs> yeah, we broke a record earlier on this year. I think it was in Death Valley or something, 134 Fahrenheit or 138 mm-hmm. Fahrenheit. It was it was the hottest it's ever been on Earth or something like that. Yeah, we talked and, about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's October used to be about 20 years ago. October used to be one of the mildest, nicest months in mm-hmm. Southern California. Mm-hmm. As May and October were the months to look forward to. They were temperate. They were it was a little bit of our of our autumn season, but now mm-hmm. it's just another month of summer, like brutal summer. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And then stop suddenly. That's the problem. Like it suddenly gets cold. That's what's (laughs) going to happen. Probably the day before, the night before Halloween. It's probably, you know, (laughs) yeah. And also, (laughs) you know, yeah. And and this, this whole, I agree with you about the election, by the way, everyone's been talking about it and it's not just this country that's worried about it. I tell you, I have a lot of family members and friends all over the world and they've been messaging me and asking me questions like, how's it going over there? What's going to happen? And, you know, I think the whole world is worried about what's going to happen with this election. So I I, hopefully something good happens, I tell you. Yeah, because it also the, the issue is that also it may linger. It's, we may not know on November 4th. So I'm going go on for weeks, maybe a month. And, you know, who knows? Yes, yes. Scandals and all this, you know, if, if, if it's been rigged. It's mm-hmm. the first time it's the mail-in ballots have been, you know, at that, to that, to that extent, they've been mail in ballots before, but to this extent, you know, so yeah. I don't know. It's just, and, and they're, I don't, not predicting civil unrest, but some people are talking about that possibility. So mm-hmm. I know I'm going to be home that weekend. That's the weekend of uh, Halloween prior. You know, I think I might be doing something with friends, but at their house. But I mean, that week, I'm not, you know, leaving the house probably until, until we find out what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Just for yes. safety. I agree. And I totally think everyone should go out there and vote, regardless of who you're going to vote for. Just go out mm-hmm. there and do it. I think it's important to voice your your concerns and, and vote and get educated as well on what they're trying to do. And hopefully, uh, like I said, something good happens for everyone. Um, I also hope the country comes together because it seems like now you mention anything with people and there's people who are going to disagree with you. And then there's a lot of arguments going around on Facebook and all the social media that I've seen. And I, it's just a little concerning sometimes. So mm-hmm. people stop talking to one another. They stop listening mm-hmm. to one another. And um, we need to have a platform where we can have a, an honest and healthy discourse with each other to understand how people see things differently. And yeah, there's the algorithms that we said, different information is being sent to different groups. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of manipulation going on in the social media about what you end up believing and how you believe it. But nonetheless, conversation has gone off the platform. It's almost mm-hmm. like they're they're uh, sculpting how we have conversations and we need to have a platform, some YouTube show or something mm-hmm. where a real conversation happens you know um where people start to understand one another from Mm -hmm. from how they see how they came to that point of view and what information that they might be missing and doing research together you know in in a discourse i think would be a healthy way to go and even people who say i don't vote because i don't think my vote matters well if you stay home your vote won't matter (laughs) yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah and I, i just listened to this podcast now that you mentioned that uh it was radio lab and they were talking about how this country has this thing about passing power from one party to another 
and mm. peacefully. And and people who you know are, don't agree with some of the the laws that that the other party is going to be Im- implementing, they still do them and they still follow them in a certain way because you know that's part of this country. We we have this this ability to have multiple uh, ways of thinking and and it's okay. Uh, but I feel like that's something that we we need to bring back because sometimes people are starting to get a little you know, uh, I'm restless and feeling like that's not right. And, and get, they get very uh, emotional about their feelings and their beliefs. And I, you know, I, I do too, but I feel like there has to be some, some, some middle ground where we can listen, like you said, to somebody mm-hmm. who maybe thinks differently than we do and, and try to see their point of view, where they're coming from and, and try to understand each other. Because I don't, I don't think that everyone is ever going to think the same. And that's part of what's beautiful about this country. And I also love that you can voice your opinions and tell people what you really think. But I think it's also important for other people to to have that ability as well and for us to be able to listen to them, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's important to be able to develop, a, like we said, a discourse. And I think the most important thing would be listing the things we see in common, mm-hmm. starting with those things. We always think we always start with what we disagree with. But if we actually... As a nation, as a as a culture, if if we if we would list the things that we see eye to eye with, let's, let's start with the things we agree with. Start with the positive on mm-hmm. this discourse show. You know what I'm saying? Some people say I should produce it. I'm like, I'm not a producer. I would otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I really would. I would think. I, you know, I mean, I I can present the idea. I could pitch it. You know, I don't know what I would do on it. Maybe I could moderate or something like that. But I but start with what we agree with. Tell me something that we're on the same page with and start with that foundation. Then we'll realize we'll probably see more eye to eye than we think we do because mm-hmm. we're accentuating the ideas that we don't agree with. And that's what's becoming polarized mm-hmm. more and more so, you know, to the extent it's becoming as if we have nothing in common, but we do. Yeah. If we, if we really pull it down, we do have some basic values that are the same. So, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, and this, this is not a political podcast. So no, we went that way. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, maybe it's because I have London behind me. I'm not in London. By the way. <laughs> right. I'm not really in London. I wish, but I'm not. Yeah. 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 No, we we just wanted to say this because the election is coming up. But today we we actually wanted to talk about the wall. Um, but this is the title that we put into this podcast. But really, uh, the the thing that we wanted to talk about is persistence and consistency, and how sometimes we hit that wall. And we stopped doing certain things that maybe at the beginning we were really excited about. Um, I was telling Neil earlier that uh, one of the things that I see all the time on my Facebook feed and my Instagram is people that I, I've known for years and they're friends of mine, family members, and sometimes they decide that they're going to start a business and they come up with this really amazing ideas and they start posting stuff about it and like, oh yeah, you know, they're very motivated. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start promoting this. Uh, or that and they start doing it and it's amazing and they come up with really really good things but then you know sometimes a week goes by maybe a couple months maybe six months and then suddenly they stop and i wonder mm-hmm. like did they die or what happened to them <laughs> and you know sometimes it's like i mentioned it's really good things that they're coming up with but what makes them stop what what is that wall that they hit that suddenly makes them not continue to to do that thing that they were so excited about and you know and i in my opinion a lot of these times these people are really good at it but they 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 still don't continue and what is it that makes them stop so that i think that's a good subject yeah i see that a lot of my practice as well people start projects endeavors businesses personal goal plans Mm -hmm. uh concepts that they're very excited about at the beginning and it gives them a certain high to sort of think about what they can do and what they will do and they set it in motion and they plan it and they design it and they get really excited about it and they begin it and then what starts to happen is they hit a wall which Mm -hmm. is what you know we call it and um they don't even know necessarily how come all the time that they're hitting that wall but the excitement fades and um or the first challenge happens the first set of challenges begins to happen the honeymoon stage fades and what often happens is a person starts a business or a project or an endeavor. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning, there's an old adage that says you can't build a reputation based on what you're going to do. 
right? So in terms of what you actually are doing, because what you're going to do is very exciting. You know, it's conceptual, it's in your mind, it gives you a sense of elation, a sense of control, a sense of power. And then once you start doing it, you start implementing it, you realize that there's a lot of different elements you may not have thought of. And what happens is the honeymoon stage, just like in the beginning of a relationship starts to fade and you get into a, a different stage and more of a bonding stage with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be moments, even though you like what you're doing, you're excited about what you're doing, you're not going to want to do everything that is presented to you. You're not going to like everything about the new job or about the new uh, town that you move to or about the new project or the new group that you put together. You're excited the first couple of times. Wow, this is awesome. Then all of a sudden people become people, you know, and work becomes work <laughs> and roadblocks become roadblocks. And what happens is certain emotions and experiences inside of a person start to come to the forefront mm -hmm. because the elation, the feeling of elation at the beginning of a project or endeavor is exactly that which is sort of whispering to you that all those uncomfortable experiences that you have in your past will not take place here. This is going to be exciting. This is going to be different. This is going to propel us into a whole new future and give us a whole new everything, right? So you're going to cancel out all the negatives. You're going to cancel out all the, all the, uh, all the pain, all the, all the distress. And unfortunately what happens is once you start doing something and it starts to level out all the stuff that you've been running from by coming up with a new project, endeavor or business knocks on your door and says, Hey, still here, you know? So <laughs> there's going to be moments where you have to contend. You can't run away from you by developing a new project, a new endeavor or a new goal plan. You could accentuate who you are. You could expand upon who you are and grow. And the only way to grow is to be with what's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, when you start a new project, you're not going to want to do it. You're going to sit there. Even when I was in my graduate program, loved mm -hmm. what I was studying. There were moments I did not want to go to class. There mm -hmm. were moments I did not like the course. I did not like the content. I didn't want to write that paper. And it was painstaking. And if I had been stopped and I did hit walls, and if I had been stopped permanently, I would have gotten less than um, you know, less than an acceptable GPA and I would have eventually stopped, you know, and mm -hmm. not continued with it. So consistency and getting over that wall is about putting yourself on reset, understanding that even within an endeavor that you love, there are going to be moments that you, do, that you dislike, maybe even hate. Yeah. This actually reminds me of people that come to me, you know, for a session and they start like really wanting to change their lives and they, they go through that honeymoon phase and they really get really excited and they try the meditation for the first time or, you know, they do certain meditations and they feel amazing and they come three, four times and then they feel really good. But then there is that plateau where, you know, we, we reach the, the top of that and the honey phase, honeymoon phase starts to go away. And then we, we start to really go deeper. And I think that's really where the, 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 the most uh, beneficial work comes in when we start to face, you know, the inner parts of ourselves and, Sometimes it takes a while to get there, but then what happens is the person just feels so good. They're just, they, they, they decide to stop coming and they just go on and live their lives and do other things. But I feel like that happens a lot too with, uh, people who start a business, for example, and, and they see themselves doing amazing things and they start it. And then maybe two people call them or maybe nobody does. And then they don't get any feedback and they start not getting any, well, I mean, they do get feedback, but it's not the feedback they want, I guess. Uh, but they start to look for for uh, ways to make money, and they want to make money now, like fast. They don't realize that people who are successful in in anything that they they do, not always, but most of the time, they they've taken a long time to get there. They've learned mm -hmm. the practice. They done a lot of things like it took me years to actually start making money worth what I do and actually make a living off of this. Uh, it wasn't easy to to do what what I love and and make money off of it and you know have people pay you for it and and not just one time but for people to come back because yeah you could have people pay you one time but the real challenge is when people come back to you and they really want to do it again that's when mm -hmm. you know that your work is really worth something because people saw some benefit to it uh, but sometimes it takes a long time to build an audience and it takes a long time to do it uh, in social media and especially now because there's so many things out there. It's a lot harder to get through people, but it's not impossible. And But the part that, that I really wanted to, to emphasize today is that part that sometimes we don't get the things that we want right away and there's no gain for us and therefore we quit early. Mm -hmm. and, and the real, 
I think the real benefits, like I mentioned, is they come later on. Like if I go, if I start going to the gym today and I started working out, the first month, maybe the first couple of weeks, I'm going to feel great, and maybe I'm going to get really sore because I've never done it. You know, if I have never been to the gym, but then, you know, a month later, uh, maybe I'm going to get used to it, and I'm not going to see a lot of differences. But if I keep doing it and I go for a whole year, there's going to be a huge change at the end of the year. And that's the part that we need to get through, that wall that stops us from going because we don't see the, the benefits right away. And, and it's what you know psych- psychology calls delayed gratification, which is one of mm-hmm. the, the things that I think it's really, really important in life. Yeah, there's the instant gratification versus delayed gratification, and that's exactly right. And there's also the reasons behind um, the endeavors that we take on. So if you go to the gym and you're willing to accept delayed gratification over one year, there's also the concept of what you're trying to accomplish by by sculpting your body or by losing the weight or by building the muscle or by doing whatever it is that you're trying to do, what you're expecting to come as a result from that you know, what you're expecting to, to see as, um, you know, as an outcome socially or emotionally or mentally, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? So instant gratification, a lot of time when people are trying to get rich overnight or trying to get slim overnight, it's because again, they're trying to run from something. Mm -hmm. They're trying to create something within themselves that makes the past or the painful memories or the low self-esteem or whatever low self-image disappear. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm thin and beautiful. Now I've got a million dollars in the bank. So that all that stuff doesn't matter anymore. It cancels it out. Fortunately, it doesn't cancel it out. It's <laughs> going to follow you and it's going to find its way back into your psyche in some way, into your personal profile in some way. Even if you take it off of your personal profile online, it's still there and it's going to find a way back. And delay gratification, even with that, you have to look at the reasons that you are using delayed gratification or, or, or in, in, taking on that endeavor, what are you expecting to come out of it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people make a lot of associations, especially in our culture, that if I'm thin or if I'm um, rich or if I'm successful or if I'm this or I'm that, then this will happen or I'll track this or I'll be able to do this. And you may be able to do all of that. And you may feel great about yourself and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the increase in self-esteem, but the association with it, meaning that, again, that other demons or whatever you want to call them or painful memories or challenges will disappear or that suddenly everybody will like you or suddenly all that you were challenged by before is going to go away is a fallacy Mm -hmm. that has people relapse and come back to their original baseline because a part of them realizes this is not going to cancel out my pain. This is not going to cancel out the things that I was unhappy with. It may improve life in some areas. But once you get past those some areas, you still have to deal with personal intimacy. You still have to deal with who you are. You still have to bond with other people. Mm -hmm. And even if people are attracted to you because you have a million dollars or because you have a thin body or because you're successful, is that the kind of intimate relationship you want to build upon? Mm -hmm. You know, if that's what they're drawn to, you know, and that's, you know, is, is that what you want them to be drawn to? Maybe initially, fine. But that's but but initially is not a problem. It's it was, comes after the honeymoon stage that becomes the issue for most people, which is why a lot of people stop because they kind of realize that they may not be able to vocalize it, but they sense something is not really changing in their mm-hmm. life. It's changing, and there's been a lot of breakthrough and a lot of great things have happened around it, but some things fundamentally are not. So that's when that's par- part of the reason they hit the wall. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I the to me when when we talk about the wall, you know, the reason why we brought this is because part of it is when you're running a marathon, for example, they say that after 18 or 19 miles, you hit the wall, right? And and then from that point on, there's a lot of people that just can't do it anymore. They stop, and there are people who continue to go through. And the wall comes from having to having depleted all your physical like all the, the the nutrients in your body and then all the energy and no matter how much you've trained that's it you're done but from that point on it's more about the mind that really pushes you through and makes you get through the all these things and that's really what you want when you start something no matter what it is you're, you're going to go through bumps and there's going to be times when things are not going to be great no matter what it is even if it's you know personal work self-care whatever it is that you're trying to do there's going to be things that you're not going to like but then when you get through those things then comes the 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 reward and and that's that reward is usually 
much more rewarding than you know if you stopped and just tried to go get something really quick kind of like the the marshmallow experiment where they they had those kids you know they gave them one marshmallow and and they, they put it in front of them and they said if you don't eat this uh and, you know within the next five minutes when i come back i'm going to give you two marshmallows and you're going to be able to eat two not just one and so mm-hmm. the kids had the marshmallow in front of them and they're like oh my gosh it looks so good and it smells so good but then mm-hmm when they were able to wait, some of them weren't able to wait, but the ones who were eventually got two of them. And that's usually how that goes. If you start start a business and you stay and you continue through it, then eventually something happens because you start to build this, this momentum and this people. And, and sometimes it's, it's slow. I'm not going to say that it takes, you know, it's going to be quick. Sometimes it is slow, but it's, it's staying in the same path that really makes you a master at whatever you do. And obviously learning, because if you're not learning something new or improving every week or every time you're trying to do something, then of course you're going to get the same results. But So we have to learn to be flexible, but to also be uh, in the same thing. Like we can't just be doing jumping around from one thing to another and expect to be good at something, right? Right, right. The trial and error is extremely important too. Mm-hmm. You know, not just in terms of improving upon what you're doing, but in t- terms of what you really want to be doing. A lot of people I have found that I speak to are searching. They don't know exactly what they want to do or how they want to do it. And they come up with a lot of ideas. And fortunately, what happens is sometimes if they if those ideas don't work out or they hit that wall mm-hmm. and they stop, they start to tell themselves a story that they're a failure, that they're, you know, they don't have it in them, that mm-hmm. everything they try doesn't work out, you know, that uh, they don't have the me- emotional bandwidth to try again, or they make it mean something. And really, it's just searching. It's just trial and error. If I look back on my own life, I can see that I tried many, many things that I thought I might want to do uh, as, a, as a way of, uh, both as a way of escapism, like I said earlier, trying to get away from something that was painful mm-hmm. and as a way of, of self-improvement. So it's not always one or the other. It was a mixture of both. And I it, it could easily have said to myself, look, I don't do well at things until I found the thing mm-hmm. that I match the best with that um, on the overall, most of my aptitude and most of my skills lean toward um, matches my personality, matches my strengths and resources, matches my, even my weaknesses, it matches. And, um, on the overall, it's a relationship with work and with self that mm-hmm. I could live with for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Does it mean every day that I'm, that I'm always elated and happy and ex- excited? No. Um, and I think anybody who comes across that way is probably going to burn out on themselves. It's probably going to end up depleted, you know, so don't be fooled because we do live in a celebrity culture. Mm -hmm. Don't be too taken in by, by the, you don't see the makeup before the show. (laughs) That is true. Very true. Yeah, don't. And, and, you know, and when you hear people on the air or when you hear them wherever they are, Mm -hmm. they're in a safe spot. So, of course, they can come across as their best, as their most jovial, as their most charming, as their most personable. But if you meet person in person in real life, you're going to meet them in real life. And it's not always what you see. And people rationally, I think, understand that. But I think a lot of times we do lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. And when we take on new endeavors, sometimes we're thinking inside of that modality that I'll end up like that, like them or like this, or, you know, take me out of this world into another world. And it's exciting at first, you know, when all that we think of all the possibilities, Mm -hmm. but the truth is, you know, um, after that fades, if the smoke clears, you're still with you, you're still with yourself. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 One of, one of the best examples that I, I I know of, um, of what I'm trying to say is the, uh, it's a documentary called, uh, Giro Dreams of Sushi. Have you heard of it? Mm-mm. Okay. Mm. So Giro, oh Giro, it's J G I R O, and it's it's in Netflix. You can actually watch it there, I believe. Um, it's it's about this guy in Japan. I don't even know he if he's still alive. He was very old in the documentary. I think he was like ninety seven or a hundred years old, and he had been doing sushi for like ninety years of his life, and it's all he's ever known. And this is a guy who who has a, uh, a sushi bar inside of a, a subway station in Tokyo. And this is the only sushi bar in the world, at least when the documentary was made. I don't know if that's the case today, but this is a few years ago. Uh, that has, uh, I think, two or three Michelin stars. And 
that is a huge accomplishment. If you ever watched that documentary, they actually explain what, what it takes to get the Michelin stars, which are the ratings to see, you know, some of the most amazing restaurants in the world. And so to have this, this rating, you have to follow certain things that, that they, they check for. And I don't remember that all of them off the top of my head, but I do remember one that stuck with me for, the, for years now, and it's called consistency. They, in order to be a, a, a three-star Michelin star restaurant, you have to have consistency, which means that you, you know, if you serve someone today uh, something and then maybe six months later, you're going to serve the same thing. It has to taste exactly the same. It has to look exactly the same. And, and the more consistent it is, the more likely you are to get this this rating. Uh, and so I thought about that. And I don't know if you know about, like, for example, Mexican food. I, I was I, There's a few Mexican restaurants that I go to. But to have, like, like, guacamole taste exactly the same and be consistent is really hard because you have to make yeah. sure the avocados are always the same and that they're ripe. And it's so hard to get a ripe avocado and in the same amount of stuff. So it usually never tastes exactly the same. It's still good. But to mm -hmm. have that consistency and to be able to taste exactly the same, it takes a lot of craft and a lot of thought and consciousness and, and mm -hmm. mastery. And that's the that's what makes a good chef. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a good quality to have in life, to have that consistency in what we do and what we bring into the world and, and whatever goals we're going to have. To have that that motivation that you you know when we start something to have that um, honeymoon phase like like stretch over a long period it's not just at the beginning but to continue it six months later or a year later and to be motivated and to continue to 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 feel that way even if you're not making the money because you love what you're doing is not you're not doing it for the money but you're doing it because you love it and I think that's important to have. I think also it's uh, important for people to know how to um, compartmentalize their energy mm -hmm. because um, if you start off on something and say there are 10 different domains of it, you're going to have that kind of energy, that kind of perfection consistency with 10, all 10 domains. But as you go through it, like I said, through trial and error, and you begin to learn, like myself as a clinician, myself in terms of what I do, mm -hmm. when I was first graduating and first training and, and being supervised and, you know, thinking of launching into the field, everything seemed important. Everything I was taught seemed of the utmost importance because that's what a student does. You take mm -hmm. in all the templates, you try them on for size, and you're <laughs> always a perfectionist and an idealist when you first come out of school. Of course you are. And then as I uh, gained experience, at least subjectively. It's not the same for everybody, nor should it be. But for myself, I learned through experience that not all 10 domains are of equal importance and not all 10 domains require all of my emotional bandwidth and all of my consistency. So not all 10 domains were guacamole. You know, <laughs> some of them were, you know, some of them were Diet Coke. You just stick it into the machine, you turn on the water and there, and there it is, you know, but you're trained to think that you're supposed to take, you know, everything's supposed to be important. You know what I mean? Right. Because you got to train somebody that way. And then you could, you can give them a little bit of wisdom saying you're going to notice three, five years down the line, that's not going to seem as important as it does now. Right. And sometimes people never tell you. That that's not going to be if you want to be a pioneer in your field, you know, a little bit of I used to be called a little bit of a rebel when I was in school. One of the uh, jokes in, on my, sometimes on my birthday cards, people would write to my favorite rebel, you know, um, when I was in graduate school, because I used to challenge things that made no sense. And I still do. Mm -hmm. And if something makes no sense, I still challenge it. I don't necessarily discard it, but I say that makes no sense. And what I think that is, is just a habitual tradition that we've carried through from decades ago when we haven't really given it new thought. Is that really a good use of your time? Is that really important? Is this really the way the system ought to go? Um, and they say, you know, you can't fight the system. Of course you can. You know, you, you don't, it's not the system that you're fighting. It's the elements within it that you're questioning. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is this helps you not hit the wall. Because if you can conserve your energy in areas that you find to be important subjectively for you, you know what's important for you. If I was running a restaurant symbolically, then the guacamole should be consistent. Then that's what I'd focus on. Let's make sure we have a way to ripen the, the avocado a certain way. Let's make sure the tomatoes are sliced a certain way. The spices are the same. They come from the same place because that might be my staple. I'm known for mm -hmm. my guacamole. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not really known for my um, salads and sandwiches, I might say, yes, I want it has to be a certain standard or we can't sell it. But if the meat's a little bit different sometimes or if the spices are a little bit off sometimes – 
that's not as important as the guacamole. That's what we're known for. That's what people come for. You see, so as long as I can take the 10 domains and break them down to say two or three that are important to me that make my business model work and keep me uh, having the same amount of consistent energy, Mm -hmm. then I can also go a lot longer. But if I think everything is important, everything that I've been taught has to be that way. I don't allow myself to grow. And I can also, that could also lead to burnout and can also have people hit a wall. And I think that's what happens a lot of times too. I see it a lot of times in my own field. I see a lot of fields, Mm -hmm. but I see it in my own field as well. People just think everything is important. And then burnout is such a big thing. And (laughs) and probably in your field too, but in my field, burnout is such a big thing. And I'm like, does not surprise me. It does not surprise me that burnout's a big thing in my field. Because when you look at the level of importance people put on things that are just not important, it does deplete you. But if you can, you know, subjectively figure it out, I'm not saying doing anything unethical. I'm talking about challenging what you've been told is, you know, what your guacamole is. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, you just just reminded me of. um, So (laughs) when I when I practiced Zen in Japan, it was very strict and you had to get up at three in the morning and you have to do this and you have to do that. And the rules are very strict and you follow them and. And, you know, there's all these things you do and, and it's amazing. And I, I, I loved it, but it is, you know, you have to be on time and you have to, and, and, and there's a lot of things that come from in Zen that come from the Japanese culture because Japanese are like that. They, you know, I've talked about how they, if the, if the train is late for one minute, it ends up in the news because that never happens. And so, um, that's how they do. But then with what you were saying just now, you just reminded me when I met the Tibetan monks and their view of the world is completely different. And I've seen uh, people in, in Zen Buddhism who have been practicing for 35 years, 40 years, and they're very strict, very serious. And to me, in my opinion, some of these people haven't, they, they haven't gotten it yet that it's not about doing the work like that and being strict and, and really uh, just meditating like 24 seven. I think life is about, realizing that there are moments like you just said that you know not everything has to be like so important where you have to be there all the time i think sometimes being loose a bit about certain things is okay and and that's one thing i loved about tibetans that sometimes you know they're not on time sometimes they eat meat and i'm like but i thought you weren't supposed to be eating meat and and so i feel like having that life where you have a little bit more freedom for yourself i mean where you're not just so strict about everything is is really a good uh, way of of living life. And I I appreciate that. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, that's, I think that's a fact that the Tibetans do it makes me feel, you know, also reinforced very much. so. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, uh, that's exact. I mean, there's certain, certain periods of your life, you're going to have to have a certain amount of discipline Mm -hmm. and, and consistency, maybe even rigidity to get through, you know, but once you've gotten through it, I mean, I know that, I'm sure you too, when I went through school, when you wrote papers and everything had to be APA style, American Psycho- uh, Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association written yeah. format. If it wasn't, they'd send it back or they take points off. Now, when I write something, yeah, it has to be appropriate, but I can come up with my own format. Depends upon the, <laughs> you know what I mean? It depends yeah. upon the source and depends on my audience. And, you know, but it's important to go through that. It's important to go through the drills. And then once you get through the drills, uh, cause that could be a wall for people too. They say, Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to nursing school or I'm going to become an accountant or I'm going to, you know, a psychology degree. And they get into it and they're like, what is this APA style? I can't possibly do this. And they, they realize that it's the honeymoon stage phase and they hit the wall and they drop out. And I did see a lot of people drop out in my, in my program. I saw a lot oh, of people yeah. dropping out, like, you know, medical school, law school, people just, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes they even design it. Some cor- not not mine, but some curriculums design a specific course that is mm-hmm. intended to weed you out. You mm-hmm. know, to make you so distressed. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh they yeah. Say the person beside you on both sides. One of you won't be here next semester. Well, thanks so much. You know. Yeah. But uh, I agree. Yeah, and they do yeah. it on purpose so that the wall mm-hmm. is there that you're going to hit. And this, you'll get through the drills. It's like mm-hmm. being trained in the army. You know, and not that I've ever been, but you know, you get through the drills and then you. You know, then once you're in a person where who could who could make certain commands, then you could use your own subjective, um, you know, subjective experience to get through something. Mm-hmm. But get through the drills, and then you could, you know, that's the hard part for a lot of people. That's the hurdle. There's the 
there's the elation, the excitement. The first hurdle mm -hmm. is when the first drills start to hit. That's the part you want to get through, knowing that they're not going to be forever. We mm -hmm. don't go through the drills forever. So that's the message that I would want to get clear is that if you're, even if you're consistent, even if you're making guacamole, make sure that you're not living in a drill mm -hmm. for the rest of your life because that will burn you out. Mm -hmm. You know, and they'll send a message to people around you, too. They won't feel comfortable around you because you're too serious about one specific domain. And um, they'll, you want them, you want them to, be, to be motivated, not frightened. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not yeah. shut down. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally agree. Well, thank you. And I think, is there any last thing you want to mention before we end today's podcast? Yeah, I got to catch my flight from London back to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I am in London. I'm just kidding. I really am here. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, good luck not catching COVID on the plane. Uh, <laughs> and I got to wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, a shield. Good. Thank you for your time, Neil. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone for has been listening to us for a while now. Really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to all the comments and the, the questions we've been getting. We really love uh, hearing from you. So please keep writing. Uh, thank you to all the people who've been donating as well. We really appreciate that. And we'll continue to do this for as long as we can. And remember, we're here every Tuesday at 6 p.m. And thank you. And oh, and you can sign up to uh, our uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube now, and we're posting this as videos, actually. So you can watch us on YouTube. Uh, just look for MindFit Podcast, and you'll find us on there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you next week, Neil. Thanks. All right, see you next week. Have all a right. good week. Thanks, too. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.